Arratxaldeon. Arratxaldeon, Jaun Andreok eta ongi etorriak. Santelmo Museoak, Donostia, San Sebastian, Bimila eta Maseiak eta Globernantzek Europar elkarrizketen barruan antolatu duten. Emakumeak eta Europar batasunari mai inguro honetara. Como sabéis, este acto se enmarca dentro de los diálogos europeos, que es una actividad en el contexto de la capitalidad europea de Donostia San Sebastián, en el que tratamos de debatir y abrir el cauce de participación sobre temas relativos a Europa. En este caso, el tema que nos reúne aquí es la, el tema de la Europa de las mujeres. Es un... Una experiencia también eh, participativa. Ahora mismo estamos, se nos puede seguir por streaming, se puede participar vía Facebook, vía Twitter. Hay dos eh, blogueros, blogueras, en este caso invitadas, que son Aurora Díaz eh, Obregón, en el blog de Picara, y eh, Elena Echegoyen, que nos están siguiendo. Eh, hemos hecho una pequeña, un pequeño experimento y que explica que veáis aquí en las paredes unos dibujos infantiles. Eh, pedimos en dos y castolas diversas eh, que, que hicieran una representación del poder y de personas poderosas. Hay asuntos interesantes, por ejemplo, si representan a mujeres o a hombres, si representan a políticos o no, de qué nivel, en qué escala de gobierno... Eh, qué influencia tiene la escuela, si hay prejuicios que se van eh, superando con el tiempo o no. En fin, hay un montón de preguntas aquí que yo dejo en el aire. Podéis mm, reflexionar sobre ello observando estos dibujos. Y es la pregunta inicial que quería plantear a, a la persona que va amablemente a moderar esta mesa redonda, que es Izaskun. Quizás con Landaida, que es eh, directora de Macunde, a la que agradezco, es que ricasco, es con, eh, por haber querido acompañarnos en este, en este acto. Después de un largo recorrido como concejal, como alcaldesa, como responsable de, del área de igualdad de, de UDEL, es ahora la, la directora de Macunde, del Instituto Vasco de la Mujer, y ella va a hacer la, la presentación de los ponentes y moderar el, el diálogo posterior. Bueno, va a rastrear un gusto hoy, está bueno, va a la única que está bien es que Raquemón, Globernance Instituto Ari, con vida pena, luz a Chagatic. Daniel, que rindo en, bueno, a usar que estar en Inguru, ni que usted dote, causa desverdines, hay para tu dicha que guste la. Al debate, bueno, va a rastrear. E, neska mutil gazteak egiten dituztenean ikusten da neskek ikusten dutela emakumeak e, ba, e, pertsona poteretsu bezala eta mutilek beste mutil batzuk ez da eta e, handiak egiten direzen einean ba, bai neska eta bai mutilak e, pertsona poderetsu modun ikusten dute gizonak eta ja ez hain beste emakumeak Eta e, gainera ikusi do danagatik olan, gainetik emendako hausnarketa bat e, eginez, ba, poterea erlazionatzen dute bai gudarekin, bai diruarekin, e, horrek e, bueno, ba, hausnarketa bat egitera behartu behar gaitu, haber zer, zer ari garen transmititzen gure e, semea labei, neska gaztei, balioen inguruan, e, Eta beste alde batetik ere, esan dezakegu ba, e, gauza hauek ba, ikisten direzela bizitzan zehar, sozializazioarekin zer ikusia e, duten esparru desberdinek izugarrizko eragina dutela e, umeengan. Eta e, bueno, horrek e, adibidez ba, e, edabideen e, garrantzia, e, eskolaren garrantzia, e, familiaren gar garrantzia, e, bueno, ba, asaltzen, asaltzen dozko, ez? Beraz, e, gauza hoietan, ba, izugarrizko atentzioa jarri behar dugu, ze ikusten dugu, zelan, e, gure seme alabek, ba, handiak egiten direzen einean, eta guk bidalitako, hainbat esparru desberdinetatik bidalitako informazioaren ondoren, ba, eurek, euren imaginarioan, 
ba, ikusten dute esan dodan bedala. Moduan ez, poterea erlazionatzen dute gerrarekin, diruarekin, gizonekin, eta horreta, horrek esan gure dau, ba, ba, lana egin behar dugula hau, hau aldatzeko, ez? Eta bai esan dozkuela, e, marraski baten bakarrik, e, pertsona poteretsua marrasterakoan, ba, lagun askoko pertsona bat batekin identifikatu dute pertsona poteretsu hori, ez? Beraz, bueno, ba, badeko gulana e, balio aldaketaren alde, edo, bueno, ba, beste motatako gizarte bat e, eraikitzeko, eta zelan e, danok zerbait egin dezakegu e, hau, hau aldatzeko, eta ez zelan neskamutilek, e, osea, txikitsuak direzenean, ba, ez direzela prejuizio edo estereotipo hoiekin jaiotzen, baizik eta bidea egiten duten Einean, ba, eta jasotzen duten informazioen ondoren, ba, eurek euren irakurketa egiten dute. Bueno, e, ez dakit, e, niritok eta njata, bueno, zein dan gure, gure goera edo Euskadi mailan e, berdintasunaren inguruan dugun egoera, eta, bueno, amar minutu ditut e, batez ere, Bueno, ba, ba, zerbait asaltzeko amar minututan egia esan ez du e, gauza az, askorako denpora ematen, baina, bueno, saiatuko naz. Eta gero bai, e, bueno, ba, e, gombidatuak ditugun, gombidatuak aurkeztuko ditut. Bueno, ba, e, gure autonomia erkidegoan e, berdintasun politikak e, duten e, egitura asaltzen e, saiatuko naz lehenik eta behin. Esan dodan modun e, oso labur bilduta, ez da? E, 2005. urtetik aurrera egitura hauek indartu egin ziren eta egoeraren argazki asko aldatu zen gure herrietan. Urte horretan e, berdintasunerako legea onartu zelako. Amar urte bete ditu lege honek eta e, erabaki politikoetarako guneetan emakumen presentzia askoz, e, askoz orekatuagoa da edo asko igotzeaz gain, Bueno, ba, mar urte hauetan e, indartu egin dira gure herrian berdintasunaren alde lan egiten e, duten egiturak, ugaritu egin dira berdintasun planak, e, lankidetzazareak ere sortu dira, erakunden artean eta esparru publiko zein pribatuan berdintasunaren aldeko e, lana bultzatu da, eta indarkeriaren biktima diren emakumen babeserako ere Bueno, ba, ongizaterako lanabez gehiago sortu dira besteak beste. Legearen kin batera esan beharra dago e, gure herrian berdintasun politikek duten beste tresna eraginkor bat e, dagoela e, eta hori da ba, mm, jaurlaritzak legegintzaldi bakoitzean ba, onartzen e, dituen e, planak, ez? berdintasunerako planak. E, legegintzaldi honetan, dakizuenez, berdintasunerako zeigarren plana onartu da. E, berdintasunerako zeigarren plan hau tresna bat da, e, gida bat, administrazio guztien zako, tresna eraginkor bat dala, esan dezakegu. E, berdintasuna lortzeko lanean, beharrezko irizpideak zehazten e, dituena. Hau da, nondik joan, zein eremu azpimarratu, elburuak eta elmugak zeintzuk diren argitu. Hori egiten du plan honek. Eh? Nora, joan nahi dugun, zehaztu, e, herri agintek berdintasunaren alorrean jarraitu beharreko jarduera zuzentzen du. Eta kasu honetan bi blokek osatzen dute zeigarren plan, e, planaren egitura. E, berdintasunaren aldeko gobernantza hobetzeko neurriak, E, guztira hauek amairu neurri dira, e, berdintasun prinzipioa Euskal Herri aginten antolakuntzan eta funtzionamenduan txertatzeko esartzen dituen aginduak biltzen eta edatzen dituenak, ba, dibidez ba, berdintasun unitate administratiboak sortu eta indartzea, e, kontratazioetan berdintasun klausulak txertatzea edo estatistika ikerketa legeetan eta aurre kontuetan ba, berdintasun ikuspegia txertatzea. Eta gero beste neurri batzuk e, daude, e, hauek dire berdintasunaren alorrean esku hartzeko ardatzak. Eta hiru ardatz 
daude nagusi. Lehenengo ardatzean balio aldaketa eta emakumen antolakun an, alduntze e, pertsonala kolektiboa eta soziala bultzatzen dira, bigarren ardatzan antolaketa sozial erantzunkidea garatzen da eta hirugarren ardatzean emakumen aurkako indarkeriaren desagerrarazia lantzen da. Hauek dira e, ardatz nagusiak eta herri aginten erreferentzia bihurtzen direnak euren politikak egiteko momentuan. Esan beharra da, e, baita ere, gure berdintasun politikek etengabeko evaluazioaren bermea dutela, evaluatu egiten ditugula herri agintek egiten dituzten ekintzak, planari dagokionez, eta evaluatu egiten dugula baita ere legearen implementazioa. Eta honekin batera, aipatu dugu legea, aipatu dugu segarren berdintasun plana, Bueno, ba, asaldu nahiko nuke ba, emakundek zer lan egiten duen testu inguru honetan. E, dakizuenez, emakunde, emakumearen euskal erakundeko, eusko e, jaurlaritzaren erakunde autonomoa da, lendakaritzatik e, zintzilikatutako erakunde bat da, eta berdintasunerako politikak diseinatu, bultzatu, haien inguruan aholkatu, koordinatu eta ebaluatzen dituena. Eta bai, gizartea sensibilizatzen duena ere. Eta hori ze helburuekin, ba, gure Euskal Autonomia Erkidegoko emakume eta gizonen artean, ba, berdintasun erreal eta eraginkorra lortzeko. Erakundeak e, bi jardute arlo nagusi ditu, alde batetik, E, administrazio publikoekin e, burututako lana, hau da ba, berdintasunaren aldeko egiturak sendotzea eta politika publikoetan e, generoaren ikuspegia txertatzeko neurriak martxan jar daitezen bultzatzea, dibidez, eta bestetik ba, gizartearekin oroar egiten dugun lana. Hau da, emakumen alduntzea bultzatuz, enpresetan berdintasun egoera sustatuz, e, emakumekiko indarkeria prebenitzeko neurriak hartuz, e, diskriminazio kasuetan aholkularitza eta defentsa eskainiz. Eta arloka joan ez, mm, bueno, ba, hauek dira gure e, zeregin batzuk. Labur bilduko ditut eta bueno, ze, e, informazio lan gainetik e, informazioa purbete ukiteko, ez? Adibidez, e, berdintasun e, politika publikoetan, ba, emakumen eta gizonen arteko berdintasunari dagokionez, ba, gure helburua da erakunde publikoen e, politikak bultzatzea, haien inguruan aholkatu, koordinatu eta horien jarraipena egiten du emakundek. Eta horretarako, ba, arauak lantzen ditu, emakumen eta gizonen egoerak e, e, egoeran hoiek izan, da, e, izan dezaketen bai inpaktuaren gaineko txostenak ere ematen dira eta bueno, hainbat eta hainbat e, batzor desortu dira e, gure e, autonomia erkidegoan dauden hainbat administrazioen arteko ba, behar den koordinazioa egoteko. Beste arlo bat aipatzearren, ba, berdintasuna enpresa eta erakundeetan. E, enpresek eta bestelako erakundeek euren barne antolakuntzan zen eskaintzen dituzten e, zerbitzuetan berdintasunaren inguruko politikak sar ditzaten e, bultzatzen da emakundetik eta e, zentzu honetan ba, aholkoa eta diru laguntza ematen diegu. Gero beste arlo bat da eskubideen defentsa, emakundearen ardura da, herritarrak defendatzea esparru pribatuan, e, gertatutako seksu bereizketari egoeretan, eta bueno, e, hori aipatu ere nahi nuen. Beste arlo bat da alduntzea eta parte hartzea, emakumek beraiek eragiten dituzten e, desberdintasunen e, gainean Konsientzia har desaten, e, bultzatu eta haien e, alduntze pertsonala, taldekoa zein soziopolitikoa sustatzen du emakundek. 
Eta horretarako, ba, emakumeen elkartei, ba, olkularitza teknikoa eta laguntza ekonomika, em, ekonomikoa ematen diete. Beste arlo bat aipatzearren, ba, emakumeen aurkako indarkeria prebenitzeko programak. Horrek bultzatu, e, eskuartze politikak proposatzen ditugu, e, mota horretako indarkeria e, pareatzen dituzten emakumei, arreta ematen dieten zerbitzuak, koordinatu eta ebaluatu egiten dugu semakundetik. Eta hor e, garrantzi handikoak dire ba bai nahiko edo beldurbarik programak e, bueno ba indarrean dausela e, berdintasuna landu nahi dugu programa hauekin berdintasunaren alde eta indarkeria prebenitzeko direzela e, nahiko programa aurrentzat zuzenduta eta beldurbarik ba gazteentzako. Segatik ba argi daukagulako e, gero eta berdintasun gehiago emakumen kontrako indarkeriak gero eta leku gutxiago izango duela asteko. Beste esparru bat balio aldaketarena. Emakundek ba jardunaldi ikastaro eta mintegiak burutzen ditu e, bai eta kanpainak, foroak eta e, komunikazio ekintzak ere Ba, e, ze helburuarekin, ba, gure gizartea sensibilizatu eta emakumen zen gizonen arteko e, berdintasuna sustatuko duten e, programak balioen aldaketaren alde ba, e, jendeak konsientzia e, hartzeko. E, gainera, e, San Berdotere ba erakundeak e, publizitate zein komunikazioaren esparruetan ere ematen diren sexu bazterkeria mota guztiak ba ezabatzeko lan egiten duela. Hori begira batzordearen bitartez da publizitate eta komunikazio esesista erabiltzeko aholku batzordearen bidez. Eta nire de, denpora amaitzear doan bezala ba bakarrik hiru ideia azpimarratu nahiko nituzke. Alde batetik, e, esan e, makundek e, dituen hogeta zazpi urte hauetan, ba, elburu nagusienetak, nagusienetan edo hildo estrategikoetan ba, jarraipen egon gorbat egon dala, egiturak e, eukidu bere garrantzia, emakunde mantentzeko aukera eman du, baina honekin batera oso garrantzitsua izan da, estrategikoak direzen hildoak ba, urte zurte mantendu direla. Hau da, ba, eskolekin egiten da lana, enpresekin, emakumen e, alduntzean, edo administrazioerekin ba, beharrezko koordinazioa eta abar. Hau da, badaude ardat batzu ustez urte, urte zurte parkatu ba, mantendu direnak eta hor daudenak gero eta sendoagoak. Bidai, bigarren idai, ideia bat da e, bestetik e, ba hori, argi dugula balio aldaketa e, dala gure helburu nagusi. E, gure balioak zorionez ba ez dira orain hogeita mar urte indarrean zeudenak, baina oraindik e, onartzen da gizonek emakumeen gainetik daudela, beraz hori aldatzeko eta sistema androzentriko batetik berdintasunean oinarritutako sistema batetara pasetako, ba balioen aldaketan lan egin behar dugu. Eraldaketa iraunkorrak lortzeko, balio aldaketak sustatu behar ditugu eta aitortu beharra dago horrek hori egiteko denpora behar dala, denpora behar dugula eta berez ez dala lortuko. Eta irugarren ideia eta azkena da elkarlanaren ideia, ez da? E, gizarte osoaren e, ekarpena ezinbestekoa da. Hau da, erakundeak, e, eskuntza sistemak, familiak, komunikabideak, enpresak, herri ekimenak, danok dugu zer egin honetan. Eta bakoitzak, bere esparruan, bakoitzak eskura dituen tresnekin, baina denak gara beharrezkoak. Izan ere, denak pausoak eman ezean ez dugu lortuko benetako balio aldaketa bat ematea. E, berdintasunak eta balio aldaketak esan dodan bezala denpora behar dute, ez dira gauetik egunera aldatu daitezken egoerak. Beraz, lana eskatzen dute, lan iraunkorra eta noski borondatea ez, 
guztiona behar dena ba eraldaketa lortzeko. Ba besterik ez horrela nire 10 minutuak bukatu dira. Orain e, aurkestera noa jarraituko garaia e, maian e, ba nirekin dauden e, Marina Caloni, Kristin Tran eta Alexandra Biderat. E, Asiko gara Marina Kalonikin, bera e, Milan e, Bikokako Unibertsitateko Filosofia Politiko eta Sozialeko Katedratikoa da. E, genero kontuetan eta gisa eskubideetan e, nazio arteko aditu garrantzitsuenetako bat da. E, kurrikulun oso interesgarria eta e, nazio arteko mailan du oso garrantzitsua. E, Britainiako Britania handiko parlamentuan ere, bueno, ba, e, aholkulari bezala e, dabil lanean indarkeri arloan. Eta hainbat liburu idatzi ditu genero indarkeriari buruz, e, emakume etorkinei buruz eta errefusiatu eta e, mugei buruz. Eta beste barik, ba, Marina Kolani ematen dio titza. Eta Marina, hemendik aurrera, mabos minutu dituzu, zure azalpena egiteko, eskerrik asko. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Landaida. Unfortunately, I cannot speak Basque, which is a very difficult language. I can understand uh, Spanish as it being Italian. And um, it's very interesting to, um, to see how, uh, also in different contexts, uh, women have the same problem uh, in a inter cross cultural way. So this uh, uh, evening we have to discuss and to open up uh, a dialogue uh, in, uh, uh, about uh, what uh, gender equality in the European Union mean. I thank you very much also Professor Daniel Inerani for inviting me here. So the first time in San uh, uh, Sebastian. Um, as said, the kind of debates about, uh, uh, about uh, I mean, uh, the issue of gender equality in Europe is really crucial in a time when the European Union seems to be in a crisis. Not only, and it is not uh, so long uh, so much popular among citizens as it was before. It's not yet a political union. It is partly unified by a common currency, the euro. It is uh, regulated by many supranational and binding treaties. It has a parliament, a government, uh, the Council of Ministers, the European Commission, but yet there is uh, many, um, many uh, struggles. Because it seems that nowadays the controversy is uh, focused on the existing and increasing tension between the richest and poorest countries, the disaffection of citizens towards what is considered something far from the daily life of citizens, Brussels, Brussels uh, the economic crisis, the rivality between national states, and the augmenting power of technocracy at the decision making. In this context, what does it mean, unit, to be uh, unifi united? between the unification between diverse populations. We are 28 states and more than 510 million people. As we know, the motto of the European Union is unit in diversity. But what does it mean, the respect of diversity, when gender difference becomes a matter of discrimination for women? In my presentation, we'll try to indicate the role that EU directives and policies have played over the lives of millions of women, as well as the discrepancy which still persists between formal representation, mainly in politics and in boards also, and the daily life of women. I mean that a substantive democracy in terms of parity between women and men has not been yet reached, so that we have the future in our hand just to change the existing situation. And I want, if possible, to show you a short video and just to uh, clarify better what is my position.
Okay, sorry. Okay, this is a. Uh, uh, oops. Okay, this is a, a video uh, called the Glass Ceiling, and the author is Teresa Serrano, a, a Mexican and uh, artist and performer. The representation is clear, is a metaphor of the difficulties that me, me, uh, women have uh, to get uh, also uh, work, decision making, recognition, and male force prevents equal opportunity for women who have to make more efforts in order to let recognize their talents. But the women then, we, you see that she is able to liberate herself. Starting from this emblematic image, what I want to argue, I'm uh, here, I want to play the role of a critical but active, uh, not only citizen and scholar, but also uh, activist, is that the European Union has played an important role supporting the respect of women's human rights, at least in terms of parity, or thought positive actions should be understood as a provisional corrective measure in situation of disparity. And positive action do not have to, to be, to remain a permanent in, uh, intervention. Because otherwise women continue to be understood as a vulnerable subject who needs to be cared, like children, which is not the case. So directives, policy, and reports of the European Union have reflected also over decades social changes, including provisions for gender equality in politics, education, science, economics, and also including uh, measures regarding health and sexual reproductive rights, up to the controversial debates also in the last uh, weeks about uh, the rights of abortion, which has not uh, been recognized as a right, also because you know that uh, in the Irish constitution, uh, it's uh, uh, said that uh, the uh, life uh, is starting from the conception, so it's not yet recognized as a right in the European Union. And also because the European Union has been very uh, important just in the development of policies with the Daphne also projects about zero tolerance against sexual domestic violence. Indeed, if we look at the main directive issues by the European Economic community, it, 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 uh, the European Union was called uh, in this way anti the Maastricht Treaty, Treaty at the beginning of the 90s, we can see the different generations of women's human rights. In the 70s, uh, the European Community directives were mostly aimed at, protected, uh, at protecting women's, uh, women workers according to the principle parity. The first directive in uh, 1975 concerned equal pay for women and men for equal work, making coherent work legislation among different member countries. And uh, then we had in, in 1967 an analogous directive stating that the principle of parity and weak, equal treatment for men and women in the access to work, employment, vocational training, promotion, and working condition. Then we had also in social security. But in the 80s, the, uh, these um, labor directives changed mm -hmm. and uh, became more focused on the promotion of self-employment of women, but also the defense of pregnant workers and uh, fuerpere. This was a shift from, so to say, social rights to also gender-based rights, mainly in terms of uh, uh, gender difference. Then there was also in 1988, there was also the, at the European Court of Justice, there was also a directive uh, which uh, make uh, admissible the principle of positive discrimination, that is the possibility to uh, have, uh, um, to uh, give the possibility of the part of which is discriminated to get uh, perhaps uh, uh, some quotas. Um, so we have a lot of directives, and uh, uh, these had, uh, have had important political impact on the national parliament and policies, changing previous national legislation regarding women and men at the workplaces, and contributed also to the modification, as said uh, the um, chair uh, women uh, here before, the modification of cultural stereotypes about the different attitudes towards caring for children among the genders. 
all EU candidate countries have to adopt gender mainstreaming in order to become matters, members of the European Union, the so-called ACQUI. Um, but it was very important also in 2000 when the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union, which is now part, binding part of the Lisbon Treaty, um, stated also the principle in Article 20 and the principle of non-discrimination. So any discrimination said on, um, based on any ground such as sex, race, color, ethnic and social origin, genetic features, language, religion and so on is prohibited. So non-discrimination but also equality between women and men. In the last years, it's also very important uh, the new, um, I mean, uh, the, um, the inclusion of 11 post-social countries in the European Union, starting from 2004, so that uh, they, we, have also in, uh, we have also the possibility for women just to interact what was not possible until the, um, when uh, Europe was split into Western and Eastern country and uh, now we have uh, uh, also um, the possibility just uh, to uh, work and to have a dialogue with women of different uh, also cultures. Uh, at the moment in the national uh, pa in the European Parliament, uh, the number of women has increased. I wanted just to show you uh, briefly a figure here. Okay, sorry. Um. This is, uh, at the moment, the European Parliament. You see that over years, uh, starting from 1979 to uh, 2014, you see that the number, the presence of women at the European uh, Parliament increased up to 37%. And this also is uh, the rate uh, in terms of uh, uh, presence of women. Uh, Malta is 67%, while in the previous parliament there was no women uh, representing Malta. And then, uh, of course, uh, Sweden, Sweden is very high, but also Italy, which was not the case until a few uh, years ago. So uh, the EU in national welfare state have incrementally modified gender policies in order to fulfill intergovernmental agreements thanks to the mobilization of women's international public sphere, and then also the Swedish colleague will talk about also the, mo the importance of the mobilization of feminists and women. Uh, also, to, however, the question about positive actions is still really very contentious. In particular, the debate on gender quotas in political elections due to the scarce number of women in representative institutions has been the cause of many controversies. Yet, in the last two decades, the idea of quotas was replaced by the concept of political parity, as proposed in 1995 by the Manifest pour la Parité in France and the, um, the change of also the French Constitution. In Italy, we also have changed Article number 51 of the Italian Constitution in 2004 in order to introduce the principle of parity, affirming that any citizen of either sex is eligible for public offices and elected positions on equal terms according to the condition established by law. And what added to this end, this was uh, the new phrase, sentence, the Republic shall adopt specific measures to promote equal opportunities between women and men. So the mission of positive actions. Uh, however, I think that is not uh, enough, uh, a formal change in constitution, but is needed also a cultural revolution. I mean, the change of uh, uh, mentalities. Um, because 50, 50-50% is, okay, the interesting measure, but it's not uh, enough. But this has really changed the Italian parliament. Uh, because in the, um, between until uh, 2013, women in Italian parliament were only 21%, the chamber of deputies, and 80%, 18% at the Senate. In the new legislature, um, there are 32% women at the Chamber of Deputies and 30% at the Senate, and is the youngest also parliament we have. 
So uh, there was a change, but it's not enough. Parity democracy here means that women and men candidates may always, um, always be represented in equal numbers in all electoral com campaigns. So um, also mainstream has been introduced in Europe and uh, in many uh, national legislation, but uh, there are also uh, difference uh, uh, still remaining between uh, uh, inequalities between men and women and men. For instance, if we look at the Global Gender Gap Report uh, 2014 uh, issued by the World Economic Forum, we see the interesting situation of Italy because we uh, have 142 countries. Italy has improved uh, the rate uh, of uh, politicians in, uh, at the parliament but uh, is not the case in terms uh, of uh, uh, employment. And so Italian is ranked uh, at the 129 positions. And the difference of payment between women and men is 7.2%. So uh, there is a, a decreasing in economic or uh, participation, women uh, with a permanent job, I mean paid, because then women work at home but are not paid or in black market, as we say, is only 45% of women, which is a very, very low rate. In Italy also, we uh, is the oldest uh, country in the world because we have a life expectancy between 70, 79, 79 years for men, 84 for women's years. Uh, we have uh, more people who die than children who are, uh, who are born. And uh, so it's a very complicated situation. Only we are an increasing of uh, the rate of born baby only because of uh, migrants, but they are not uh, Italian citizens. So it's a very complicated situation. Um, the reflection, so uh, what I'm saying, that now gender issue is not only a, man, a, a matter of women, but also what is the approach of intersectionality. It means that when we talk about the women, we, can, we have to uh, consider other determinations, the age, race, because it's clear that my condition as a catedratic, as a full professor, is not equal like uh, a woman who is black or handicapped and so on. So it's becoming more and more complicated also in terms of intersectional issues, but also, also in terms of the, the uh, connection between difference, gender difference and diversity, like in the case of lesbian, gay, bisexual and transgender issues. So, but as said, gender issue is still at the core of the issue of the respect of human rights, because uh, I think that is a persistent struggle for women at the global level in form of request for respect and human dignity as many public demonstrations have shown everywhere. Like also in the case of the mobilization of uh, Indian women against rapes and acid attacks, which indicate not only the persistence of traditional forms of patriarchy, but new times of reactions of men who do not want to recognize women's agency and freedom, like in the case on the increasing number also of feminicides and domestic violence. After many centuries of women's rights claims and battles, it seems that institutional politics, at least in Western countries, has formally recognized women's request and to some degree incorporated the lessons of feminism into their legislations. However, power still resists change and law cannot function without deep social and cultural transformations. A substantial democracy, as said at the beginning, can work only when rep repressive attitudes, traditional mentalities, and imaginaries of violence are replaced by concrete gender equality woven into the context of daily life. Therefore, feminism still maintains, I think, a utopic core. While the idea of an external and male-centered utopia seems to have failed in Western countries with the emerging of neo-populism and anti-system rebellions, new forms of intrinsic and immanent utopias starting from bottom up that is against the violation of human dignity has been globally affirmed also thanks to the constitution of a new global public space, 
thanks also to the use of the social media and networks. Namely, feminism has shown that ex negativo, a concrete idea of utopia, remains in daily life as a frame for a better life, conditions, and is the name of human dignity, as demonstration and revolt in Western states and countries in development transition have showed. I am trying to conclude now my presentation. That is that the cross-cultural spirit of feminism in form of a resilient utopianism is used intersectional to any form of political system if based on peace and the respect of human beings. Concrete hope is always the resistance and resilience on this earth as the perseverance of a global women's movement over centuries as shown because not only of the persistent of traditional form of discrimination, but for new kinds of marginalization, deprivation, and inequalities due to neoliberalism, tendency, and financial globalization. We are all European people, men and women. So we have, uh, so to say, uh, the, also the, the duty to image and to prospect a common future based on prosperity, peace, and respect and human, human beings, but also feeding the planet, which is the key word uh, of the coming uh, um, world exhibition in Milan. You are invited. We start uh, from the 1st of May until end of uh, uh, October, and it will be dev devoted to environment, quality of humanity, and food. So we have to find a new relationship between populations culture and the environment in, name, in the name of future generation, also rethinking the myth of Europe, because we know that Europe was a woman uh, who was uh, kidnapped and raped by Zeus in, a, in the mytho Greek mythology and taken to Creta, and she became the queen, and, uh, and from there started also the uh, Western civilization. We have uh, to think about the myth of Europe in a very different way as a space of freedom. Women, we are, as women, I could say, citizens, we are not afraid to take this challenge, starting from our daily life. And uh, as an Italian anti-fascist and philosopher Gramsci said, dobbiamo avere il pessimismo della ragione e l'ottimismo della volontà. We have to have, to have the pessimism of reason and the optimism of the will. And uh, I think that we can reach it. Thank you very much. Es que regas con María. Iruren e, intervenzio amaitu ondoren, aukiko dugu galderak egiteko aukera. E, eta hori asfi marratu nahi nuen. Orain egin beharrean galderak, ba, maieran egingo ditugula. Bueno, e, Marinak e, berba indosku e, ba, kristalesko e, sabaiaren inguruan, e, politikaren arloan ere esan duzelan eta emakume gehiago e, parte hartzen duten, e, baina e, bueno, ba, e, mentalitate edo ideien e, aldaketa behar dugula, ez da? Edo zein kasutan e, poterea e, bueno, ba, e, resist, resistentea dela, ez? Aldaketaren e, kontra agertzen dela, eta e, aipatu du ere zelan e, bueno, ba, badauden e, ba, diskriminazio e, mota barriek. Edo zein kasutan, ba, e, honi aurre egiteko ba, lana egin behar dugula, ez da? Bueno, orain, Kristin e, e, Traneri emango dio titza, bera Europako Ligebeltzarrean Feministit Iniciatif e, alderdiko aulkulari politikoa da, e, mugimendu feminista hau sortu zenetik, 2015 urtetik, lan egin du bertan, alderdiko hauteskunde batzordean. E, aurretik eskuntza arloan aritutakoa da, eta gobernuz kanpoko arloan, e, lantokian diskriminaziorik esegoteko eta berdintasunaren aldeko legearen alde ere lan egin zuen. E, teknologia arloko enpresa munduan, emakumei goimailako lanak lortzea, zailtzen 
dieten egitura informalak aztertzen duen proiektu baten buru izan da, eta gaur egun Europan zehar dabil feministak tokiko nazio mailako eta Europa mailako hautezkundetan parte hartu desaten sustatuz. Nahi dozunean, Kristin, zure araitza. Ok, thank you. Hello everyone. First of all, I would like to thank the organizers of this event for inviting us. Glovenance, the city of San Sebastian and also the San Telmo Museum for hosting this event. We're very happy to be here from the Swedish Feminist Initiative and tell about our work in the European Parliament, but also in Sweden. Um, but first, I would just like to talk about why a feminist party, because that is uh, the question that we are having from uh, many people uh, when we entered in the European Parliament. Why do we need a feminist party? Uh, well, for us, uh, we started a feminist party because the other parties, the established parties, uh, obviously have failed to tackle the issues, the problems uh, of gender inequality. Uh, of course, many parties, they are working with this issue, uh, but it is always an issue maybe secondary on the agenda, or maybe third, or maybe tenth, but is, it is never the first, the most important issue. So we wanted to have a party that would put gender equality and human rights on the very top of the political agenda. Um, so we formed the Feminist Initiative in 2005. Uh, so we have been existing for 10 years now. Um, and the idea of a feminist party also came from uh, the idea of uh, that we who work with these issues could actually be politicians ourselves. Uh, many of us came from women's organizations, from NGOs, from grassroots, from the LGBT movement, from the anti-racist movement, and we had been lobbying towards politicians for a very long time without anything happening, or maybe things were happening, but change was going too slow, and we wanted to, you know, speed up things. Um, so instead of lobbying towards politicians, uh, we thought that we could be the politicians ourselves because we know best uh, what is the problems and what to do about them. Also, I think a feminist initiative or any initiative that puts human rights on the top of agenda is very important during these times where we see a lot of um, negative uh, developments in Europe. We see a lot of fascism and racism growing. We have uh, fascist parties in uh, every parliament in the whole Europe. And in, two, in the election in 2010, uh, Sweden also had a fascist party enter the parliament. And uh, they are very organized. We see this in the European parliament. Uh, they are very organized transnationally. So we as feminists, as uh, human rights activists, we also need to be very organized in Europe. Uh, and also that's why we are very happy to be here because uh, this is actually our second stop on a, a European tour. We were in Italy l last week, in, uh, in Genova, in Torino, and uh, Imola, also in Milan, actually. Where? Uh, where? Yeah, okay, Milan, okay. Yes. Uh, <laughs> So, yes, it's very big. Uh, we were there for four days and we met with feminist organizations and many are very eager to maybe start something similar. And we see the same thing all over Europe, even here. Uh, yesterday we met with um, PLAS. Plus uh, and we learned that there is actually a feminist party here. Uh, who will run for the local government in, in two months. So uh, we are very happy to learn that there is a lot of initiatives going on. And we would like to see more feminist initiatives in all countries so that we can be more uh, feminist parties who will put human rights on the top of the agenda in the European Parliament next time. 
So during the last European elections, we had 5.3% of the votes in Sweden, so we had one seat um, in the European Parliament. One deputy member, her name is Soraya Post, and I work as an advisor for her and for the party in, in Brussels right now. Uh, but we're already starting our working so that we can be more uh, the next election. So, um, just a little bit about uh, feminism, because there is a lot of uh, different perceptions uh, of what is feminism. But for us, it is uh, about social, economic and political equal rights for women and men. And, and this means that a feminist party is not a women's party. Um, this is a, a very important difference. A feminism has a vision about a different society. We don't want to reverse the, the current order of patriarchy, of men being here and women here. We don't want it to be like this. We want it to be like this. We want men and women to be equal. So that is what feminism is about, and this is something that we are trying to communicate, but as, because as you know, there is a lot of uh, misconceptions about uh, feminism. And for us, for the Feminist Initiative, uh, another important idea was uh, to address the issues of all women, uh, not a certain particular group of women, but all women. Uh, to have equality for all women and men, of course. And this means, of course, dealing with um, LGBT women, women with disabilities, migrant women, uh, undocumented women. Uh, and we had women coming in from all these movements uh, forming our party. And you can imagine, of course, in the beginning, there was a lot of discussions and conflict because we came from many different uh, areas from the LGBT movement, from the anti-racist movement, everyone came in with their own demands. Um, but I think it's important to meet and have these discussions, even to have these conflicts, because from the conflicts you can move forward. And after a few years we actually managed to agree on a common platform that is today our party program. And we actually have uh, uh, some pictures that I would like to show. Uh, I think this is the, the, this one. the corner, yes. I would just uh, show you some pictures from, from our campaigns and how we did it. Do we have to go? Yes, I think I can, uh, yeah, okay. So, um, we were in the beginning a small party with no money, so how do you do a campaign without any money? Uh, we started, for example, one of the first things was that we offered a lecture or a meeting with our party leader. And she's quite famous because she came from the left party. She left the left party because she was uh, fed up with the male structure. So she said, okay, I will leave the left party and start something new and uh, do feminist initiative. So we said, if you can gather uh, 25 people or more in the room, we will send her and she will come for free and talk about what is feminism, talk about politics. And first we thought, okay, maybe we will have one request a day, but it ended up being uh, four lectures every day for a whole year uh, during, I mean, before the elections. Uh, so people uh, gathered their neighbors, their friends in their living rooms, and they said, okay, we have 25 people, can you please uh, come uh, and tell us about this movement? And uh, we went to working places, uh, organizations, and uh, we had to involve more candidates and more people doing these, uh, what we call, home parties. Uh, I think, can I? No. Oh, you can stay at the picture, it's okay, I can't, yeah. Um, another campaign that we did, because we couldn't afford to print, um, to have the TV commercials or print big posters, so what we did was that we made these pink glasses that anyone could print from the internet, and we put them on the other party's uh, posters to create a debate. Do you have your feminist vision on? Do you have your feminist glasses on? 
and the media went to ask the other parties, uh, what are you going to do about the gender inequality, for example? So we created a pressure, even if we didn't uh, get into the national parliament, we created a pressure on the other parties to improve their politics because, of course, they were afraid to lose voters to us. So they had to shape up their own politics. Is it possible to... No, it's, it's fixed. Ah, there. So this is uh, what it looked like. And I think we have another picture. This is from the, uh, yeah. And this is our prime minister and uh, the new elected prime minister, the other one, yes. So this is a very simple way because when we meet feminists in Europe, they say, but we are so few, we are only 20 people, we don't have any money, but you don't need money. You can actually do a lot of um, debate with just small uh, things like this. Okay, so, yes, this is uh, our party leaders, uh, Gudrun Schyman and Sissela Nordling Blanco. We have two uh, spokespersons uh, from our party. Uh, yes, and this is Soraya Post, a member of the European Parliament uh, in Brussels uh, at this moment. So, Okay, so Alexandra will tell more about the, what happened in Sweden and I will go more into uh, the EU politics. Uh, what is the current situation uh, in EU? And I think uh, Marina already gave a very good uh, overview of what is happening, but uh, above all, what does a feminist party want to do uh, in the European Parliament? What do we want to change? Uh, so, there are many areas in gender equality that the EU, uh, above all, uh, the EU can legislate within working life, but also in some social area and pensions. And EU has been having legislation uh, on, um, against discrimination based on gender since 1976. So it's a very long time. You can imagine uh, how slow things are uh, since we still have a lot of problems and in, um, in this current situation, we have 63% of women in the EU working, and we have 75% of the men. So we have a gap there. There are more men than women uh, working. And we have also a pay gap of 16%. For the same work, men earn 16% more than women. And we also have a pension gap of 39%, which is very huge, and which means that mi when many women actually retire into poverty when they retire. And concerning violence against women, every third woman in Europe since the latest uh, report has experienced violence since the age of 15 years, and 50% have sometime in their life experienced sexual harassment. So, what we want to do from the Feminist Initiative is that we want to strengthen the protection against discrimination in the EU, and not only on gender, because as we know, many women face discrimination on other grounds. And currently, uh, we want to push for, for a new uh, directive that would have a protection against discrimination in all areas, not only working life. Uh, on the grounds of not only sex, but uh, sexual orientation, ethnicity, age, religion, etc. Uh, we're also to pr trying to promote an open Europe because um, when we see in the world that conflicts are increasing and more and more people have the need uh, for protection against, uh, from war, from persecution, and we see a development in Europe of a more restrictive migration policy, that Europe is even closing its borders. And this is something that we want to change. We want to create more open and safe uh, ways uh, to come to Europe for everyone. Last year, it was estimated that about 3,000 people ha have died in the Mediterra Mediterranean while trying to to come to Europe. I mean, the Mediterranean is becoming a mass grave at this moment, just because 
the restrictive migration policy of the EU. We also want to work for more accessible childcare. The EU has set up a target already in 2010 that 90% of all the children before the school age would have ac accessible childcare, but as you know, obviously this is not in place. Uh, so we have to work to realize the goals that the EU already has set up. And since there is no um, efficient or not, uh, not enough accessible childcare, women still today in Europe have to choose between work or family. And this, of course, um, has consequences later in life with the pensions and everything. And um, of course, there are many suggestions to improve this, uh, uh, but many member countries, they use the argument that it would be too expensive to pay for, or it would be too expensive to pay for more uh, maternity leave weeks, for example, but we are trying to uh, push for that it is not a, an economic issue. Uh, I mean, this is an issue of uh, fundamental rights. Um, Also, for many years, many NGOs have been pushing for legislation, for EU legislation on violence against women, but we, are, we still don't have uh, such a legislation. So this is also something that we are trying to, to see how we can push for. Uh, and of course, we also want uh, better EU legislation on, on parental leave. Um, and I think our general uh, standpoint on EU uh, is that we want the EU to set minimum standards in issues of gender equality and human rights. We don't want the EU to, to um, impair member states who already have better legislation. We just want the EU's role is to set the minimum standards uh, in these issues. And uh, I think I'm running out of time, but uh, another goal that we have outside the European Parliament is this project of mobilizing feminist parties or feminist initiatives that can push uh, the politics in the right direction. Um, and um, a common question that I had when I met feminists in Italy or here is, uh, but you have already gone so far in Sweden, why? Why do you actually really need a feminist initiative? Why there and not here? But because here we need it. And, and my answer to that is that we sh I don't think that we should compare countries between countries. We should compare uh, to, uh, with the goal that we want to reach, the society uh, which we want to have. And um, compared to the, the goals that we have, we have a, a long way to go, I think, both in Sweden and in the whole of Europe. So with that, I will uh, let Alexandra uh, continue. Christine Esquerri Gasco, bueno, verá que a saldo dos cuselan eh, alterdi tradicionaletan eh, gisa eskubideak eta berdintasun politikak behar den modun eh, ba ez ziren lako eh, bueno, lantzen eta horrezagatik ba pentsatu zutela feminista eh, partidu alderdi hori sortzea. Gogoratu dos cuselan feminismoa berdintasunaren alde lan egitea dela eta ba, emakumen artean dagoen anistasuna ere eh, aipatu du. Eta zelan e, izugarrizko lana egiten da bizen lanetan eta e, bueno, hainbat e, kampaina martzen jartzen e, elburu batekin, ez? E, berak e, azkenan aipatu dudan, duena, ez? E, bueno, ba, e, gizarte hobe bat lortzeko elburu horrekin. Bueno, eta orain e, pasatuko diogu itza Alessandra Biderateri. E, bera politikari suediarra da eta giza eskubideen aldeko aktivista. E, Estocolmon autatutako ordezkari politikoa da eta alderdi berekoa e, autagai oia Europako legebiltzarrean. E, neska gazten eta transgenero gazten aldeko lana egiten duen gobernuz kanpoko erakunde bateko gerentea da eta bere espezializazio eremuak dira 
emakumen eskubide sexual eta ugaltze eskubideak, feminismo interseksionala eta LGTB eskubideak. Alessandra, nahi dozunean, zurea deitza. Thank you so much. Uh, it's so nice. Hello, everyone. It's so nice to be here, all the way from Sweden. Uh, I'm so proud to say that I'm now an elected uh, representative in the municipality of Stockholm, Sweden, uh, where I am a board member of the Chief Guardians Committee. So it's very fancy to be a feminist and work with politics in Sweden right now. Uh, and I want to start... Uh, do, you, do you have your cards in the public? Did you get some cards? No? Okay, so maybe um, I have, uh, I have a, a quote for you, and if you agree with me, I want you to raise your hand, okay? Sweden is the most equal uh, country in the world. How many believe that? Can you, if you raise your hand, if you believe that? Okay, okay. <laughs> thank you so much. So, so let's face it, you know more than we, the Swedes, know, because we in Sweden, we, we are not the most equal country in the world. Uh, in fact, we're just number four at the list, and it's, Iceland who tops the list of the most, Iceland is the most equal country in the world. Uh, but the Swedes themselves believe that Sweden is the most equal country in the world. And this is a big problem for us. Uh, because the problem with un the understanding of feminism and gender polit politics in Sweden is that it's in large a myth. The rise uh, of a feminist party in Sweden, it's not incredibly surprising. Yes, you can say that Sweden is ranked one of the best places for women to work and have children. In addition to that, allowing up to 12 weeks of paid parental leave for both men and women. Sweden was also the first nation to introduce a gender neutral pronoun pronoun, is it, it's called, hen. So uh, now it's uh, incorporated in our language since uh, last year, the year of 2014. But Sweden, it's also the place where men dominate corporate boards, make more money than women for the same, exactly the same work. And they take four times less parental leave than women. And of course, you can add to the everyday sexism in our country and uh, the sexual and gender violence that exists in Sweden. We have a high percentage, uh, but so does it in every, literally every country in the world. But the fact that Sweden is better than other countries when it comes to gender polit politics, it's not to say that equality has actually been achieved. So in 2005, as Christine says, uh, fem the feminist initiative was founded, uh, and it begins with the premise that equality is the answer to the majority of society's ills. And with equality, we mean that Everyone should be able to participate and feel reflected in the cultural, political, and economic spheres. But of course, in a patriarchal, male-dominated culture, it is women who suffer the most by this inequality. And when you add factors such as race, disability, and sexual orientation, uh, equality in society is pushed even further out of reach. And that's why we in the Feminist Initiative, we uh, always talk about the intersectional feminism and think that's so important. 
And I want to talk to you about the term equality and what it means to us in the feminist initiative. Because we say that equality is not just about the economics. Yes, it is an important factor, but equality, it also means being able to participate and feel reflected in the cultural, political, and economic spheres. And every person should have the right to make decisions about their own body. And society, society needs to be accessible to all, regardless of ability. And we also say that for us, equality is also about freedom from violence being able to love who you want to love, to present yourself in that way you choose, and to believe in what you want without fear of threats or discrimination. That's equality to us. And we, we had this uh, nice uh, slideshow with a lot of pictures from our uh, uh, campaign in Sweden. Uh, I wonder if we can show some pictures. Marina, if you can help us. Yes. Okay. yes? Uh, Thank you. So as Christine said, we, we didn't have any money, but we had a lot of creativity in our campaign. Uh, and this is one of our posters. If we can stop and back. Go, if you can go back one picture. Uh, yeah, this one. Uh, this is uh, one of our posters. This is one of our top candidates for, to the parliament, Swedish parliament. Um, and we made this classic feminist picture and we just put her in the picture and posted it all over Sweden. Uh, and if you can switch and go back one more. This, uh, this, is, uh, this was a huge success for us and we still have this, home parties. I want to talk to you about home parties and what you can do with politics to unite people. When we had our election campaign, uh, some of uh, our candidates uh, went out and said to, uh, to the people that we think uh, we should talk about politics instead of plastics. Do you know these Tupperware parties that they have in the United States? They sell this plastic, like, I don't know, What's it called? Bags, cans. And they sit and talk about plastic. And we said, no. Uh, so this is like a twist with, uh, that we think that the society today is so full of plastic and so shallow. So we, and we also said that when every, every party in Sweden, like the big parties in Sweden, they call to people and they go and knock on the doors and say, hello, vote for us. But we say, we don't just knock on your door. You can call us, you can, you can book a feminist, and we come to your house. We just knock, we, we go inside, and we talk to you. So we can sit and talk politics for two hours and have a coffee. So this is our, as you see, Gudrun Schilman, this is our uh, leader. And when she's having a home party in someone's living room in Sweden. So the last year we went from north to south of Sweden, Sweden, having, going home to people in their house and talk to them about our politics and about feminism and about human rights and equality. And we had an open discussion with everyone who invited us. Uh, and it was a lot. Of, I don't know, do you know, Christine, how many we did? More than 100, 200, 300. Gudrun, she had five or 10 each day, this home party speech. We were everywhere. So the media and the other parties, they tried to shut us out in Sweden and they didn't want to talk about uh, gender equality too much or because they didn't want to promise anything because they don't want to make it a priority. But we were everywhere. We were on social media, we were on Instagram, we were on Twitter, uh, we were writing like debate articles every day. Every one of our candidates, we just, pushed ourselves into politics in Sweden. So we took our place. We didn't stand and wait and ask, uh, waited for someone to ask us to enter. We entered the politics ourselves, by ourselves, with no money. Uh, so Marina, could you help? <laughs> Thank you. Yes. 
uh, again, uh, this is one another of our party leaders, Cicela Nurling Blanco. We have two, Gudrun and Cicela. Uh, and this, you can stop here. And I'm going over to talk about our representation in Sweden. Um, and you can say it as Kristin said, Kristin uh, talked about uh, European elections. Uh, but we went through what uh, we call a feminist spring in Sweden last year. We went from maybe 200 to 300 members in our party to literally over a night it changed and we became 4,000, 5,000, 6,000. We rose. Our polls rose like this every week. And it's, it was due to a lot of different factors. We can say, it, okay, it's this factor that made it. It was because we did all these home parties, we wrote articles, uh, there was a big feminist, it became a big feminist discussion in Sweden that helped us as well. So we made like this huge public debate as well. So yeah, in a couple of weeks during the last spring, we had this explosion in the polls and uh, we are now the first feminist party to have a seat in European Parliament. So we wrote history last year, uh, and we still can't understand it, I think. I have to pinch myself sometimes and think, say that, okay, so now we can actually get some money to, be, to have, make feminist politics. It's amazing. Uh, and uh, in Sweden, we are criticized from some people who say that uh, our parties, that we, we can seem as alien to outsiders and they say that we are too academic, that we have such a hard language, that we talk about heteronormativity, structural discrimination, pat patriarchal and subordination. Um, and we are, sometimes dismissed as a one-issue party uh, and that we don't know how, t how politics works in practice. Uh, but to me, uh, this criticism and this dismissal, it misses the larger point. And it is that even if we, we didn't made it to the parliament, the Swedish parliament yet last year, we had the elections last year and we didn't, we were just below the, the bar. Um, so, but next, next election we're gonna get in, I'm, I'm sure. Uh, but the missing that we managed to, to change the political landscape in Sweden, and we managed to put a real debate about feminism and gender in Sweden at the top of the politics in Sweden. Uh, and also we made uh, people aware about the term intersectionality that both Marina and Christine talked about. Because we, ex we explained in every speech, everything we talked about, we said that it's not just an equality that is between men and women. It, there are much more f different factors. It, it depends on where you were born, which color of your skin, if you have disabilities, but what kind, who, which person you love, and so on. Uh, so that's, I think for me, personally, that's the most important thing that we achieved, um, apart from becoming a member of the European Parliament, because we have a great influence there. But this is really big for Sweden and pushed the debate forward in Sweden. Uh, and we also see that feminism in Sweden have a really promising future. Uh, we had 3.1% uh, from the Swedish votes in the election. Uh, it's uh, just below, we need 4%. So it was, I think it missed like uh, 70,000 votes or something. So it's not much. Uh, and of those votes, 70% who voted for us are under the age of 25. These are young people. And we have uh, this um, uh, young feminist section 
which is like the which is the, like the young section of our, our party. And they contacted us, like the mother party, and said, hello, we are too young to vote, but we are feminist. I'm 16 years old, I'm 15, I'm 14, but we are feminist. And we want to be a part, uh, we want to have our own like membership in your party. So they started like this youth, um, youth uh, organization inside our organization. And we said, yeah, okay, if you want to do it, but you have to fix your own board and manage it by yourself. And they were like, okay, we're gonna have elections. We're gonna elect a board. And now there are more than 2,000 young people under the age of 18 who are organized feminists in Sweden. And they teach it, each other about, they have their own home parties. They invite us to talk about intersectionality, anti-racist, uh, they debate in the schools and are so proud to be feminists. And it's Im amazing to see. Um, and with these numbers that we have now, we are the uh, largest uh, party outside of the parliament in Sweden. And we have more than 22,000 members, uh, which is very, very many. I think it's, we are the second largest party now, third largest party in numbers as well members and as you can see here this is the the map of Sweden here and this is yeah this is our, our the Swedish uh, cities where we no, now uh, have a representation uh, so we are in 13 different uh, municipalities in Sweden and they are marked you can see so you can see it's from up north to down south here and I sit in, in the capital, in uh, Stockholm. And in Stockholm, we also form a political majority together with the Social Democrats, which is uh, the largest party in Sweden, and the Green, the Green Party in Sweden. So we have political majority in Stockholm. And in Stockholm, you decide much of the politics you decide in, in the town hall. Um, and one of uh, our political spokesperson, Cisla Nuling Blanco, as you saw before, she has the chair of the Human Rights Committee in Stockholm. So we managed to, to uh, fund like an institute that, only, that is supposed to guard over human rights in Stockholm and how well Stockholm works with human rights. So that's a big victory for our party in uh, Sweden. And as I said before, we see that we are a party for the younger and for the coming generation in Sweden. So I think that we are positive, I'm positive, and full of hope about the future for the feminists in Sweden. And uh, I think that the feminist initiative is the political party of the future, not just in Sweden, but possibly the world. So thank you so much. Bueno, Alessandra Asida Aitortzen Araso bat dala ustea berdintasuna lortuta dagoela. Horrek e, bueno, ba leuntzen duela edo frenatzen duela egin beharreko lanak, ezta? Eta berak e, aitortu du naiz eta aurrerapena asko lortu oraindik euren artean ba badaudela e, arazo desberdin, ezta? E, gizonak emakumeak baino gehiago irabazten dute, e, gizonen bajak umeak jaio ordun, e, bueno, ba oraindik e, gutxiagoak dira. E, genero indarkeria ere hor dagoela e, eta horrezek e, gai guztiek ba, euren lana bultzatzen e, dutela eta lana egin beharra dagoela e, bueno, badierazten dutela, ezta? E, hainbat e, e, ekimen ezagutzera eman dozku, etxeetan egiten direzen festak eta bar, e, edo, edo feminista gazteekin duten e, taldea e, 
eta bueno, baudalek duten garrantzia ere aipatu du, baina nik niri gehien bat gustatzu e, zaidan e, esaldi bat, da e, berak esan dauena, ez? Berdintasuna e, gure gizartearen gazoi, gaizotasunen e, konponbidea dela, ez da? Hori, e, gustau jata batez ere berak esan dakoaren arabera. Eta ziur izugarrizko sortea eukiko dutela. Eta eragina. Bueno, orain, e, esango dizuet e, galderaekin hasi baino lehenago, bueno, ba, daudela Twitterren bitarte sartu direzen hainbat e, galdera. E, beraz, lehenengo galdera hoei erantzuna ematen saiatuko gara, eta gero, e, bueno, ba, une bat eukiko dugu, ba, hemen sausien artean e, galderaren bat badago, ba, e, planteatzeko eta erantzuna lizateko. Mm, beraz, e, bueno, ba, asikonaz, e, Katerinari e, susenduta dagoen e, galdera batekin. E, eta holan dio, la competencia de la Unión Europea para legislar en materia de igualdad de género tiene antecedentes desde el año 1957. ¿Creen que es el mecanismo más acto y directo para romper, eh, para promover perdón, la igualdad de género a nivel de la Unión Europea eh, la reforma legislativa? Una reforma legislativa. Marina, no Caterina. Igual vamos a intentar eh, eh, responderle entre todos porque eh, Caterina eh, hoy no ha podido estar aquí, entonces uh -huh. vamos okay. a tratar de entre todas sí, eh, sí. dar, okay. dar una, una respuesta, a ver okay. cuál es nuestra opinión. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Legislative reform is the most adapt and direct method for promoting gender equality at EU level. Um, Katerina refers 1957 was one of the first act of the uh, not was not yet European Union was very uh, was a founding and uh, was uh, the first um, when uh, firstly uh, the issue of uh, uh, gender equality was mentioned. Uh, as I tried to say, uh, um, not a legislative reform, but uh, a formal approach that is also provisions uh, and so on is not enough. Uh, just or parity legislation is not enough to change mentality because what we have to do is a, a, a cultural revolution. I think that is, in any case, it's very important to have legislation on parity because. Uh, some has changed. We have more women at the parliament who can play a role. I was uh, some weeks ago at the parliament, so I met uh, uh, women at the Senate and the Chamber of Deputies, and uh, they, are, they make the difference. So I think that's very important, their presence, but it's important also to have a substantial impact over the uh, changing of mentality, because otherwise it's not enough just to have uh, uh, I mean, uh, also parity uh, projects or uh, quotas. In Italy, quotas uh, are uh, uh, not uh, permitted because they are, have been considered as uh, um, anti-constitutional. So what we talk about is parity. That is uh, with the transformation of the Article 51 of the Italian Constitution. So I think that we have to improve the idea of equality because uh, the issue of equality is something that starts uh, from daily life is not a formal meaning, is not a member 50-50, but we can start from some, uh, some uh, uh, I mean, formal reforms, but then we have to try to get a substantial uh, form of democracy, starting from the respect in daily life, because I think that family is a matter Family is uh, uh, where people live daily, is a matter of uh, where people learn 
to uh, equality, respect, uh, and uh, the grammar or, uh, of uh, justice. So I think that we have to start uh, from uh, the grassroots, uh, from uh, our, the context uh, of our daily life. So I think. Mm -hmm. Yes, I think legislation is, is very important, and uh, I just heard from uh, the previous uh, presidency, it was the Italian presidency in, uh, in the EU, now it's Latvian, but uh, from Italy they told me that they introduced quotas for women on company boards in 2009. Parity, and we don't, uh, it's yeah. not, I mean, uh, officially we cannot talk about quota, we, can, yeah. we talk about uh, parity. Okay. Because uh, quota is, not, is considered a, anti-constitutional. Ah, okay. Uh, but since they introduced this, the, the women on boards have increased from 6% to 25%. So it does have an effect. And in Sweden, for example, we would not have the anti-discrimination leg legislation that we have if it weren't uh, for the EU legislation in this area. Um, so I think it's very important, but one problem is also that the legislation that we have is not properly implemented and we don't have effective mechanisms for uh, uh, having procedures against member states who, who don't follow uh, the legislation that we have taken. So that's also something that we have to work on on the commission to, to actually find a way, a mechanism to, to follow up uh, how human rights uh, legislation is um, implemented in the member states. We have a lot of criteria for the new, uh, for the candidate countries, but for the countries that are already, has already become a member of the European Union, uh, we still have a lot of work uh, to do there. Yeah. I, uh, I can just add uh, that I also think that um, Legislation is really, really important, but still, uh, I think it's not enough. You have to combine it with um, to work to try to change the gender roles and the norms in society. You can just have like legislation, and then it's enough if you don't have any <coughs> sanctions or any following work from it. So I think it's you can't just work with policy documents and so on. You have to find ways to implement it and to change the mentality of the society. So I think a combination. Something that is very important also, the, um, uh, I mean, how women also influence the changing meaning of human rights. Because human rights are not meant by uh, women's movement as a matter, formal matter, article and so on, but it's something that comes from experience of violation and discrimination. And uh, I think that uh, legislation, directives, convention at the international level, it's really, I mean, uh, a victory of women's movement because it was a matter of recognition starting from grassroots experiences. Uh, because we have different levels, also legislation at the supranational. We have uh, the UN level with the uh, Committee uh, for Women. Then we have also the level, or, I mean, uh, of the European Union, but it's very important also to stress the role of the Council of Europe in Strasbourg, which has not to do nothing with, um, uh, with the European Union, as it's composed by 47 countries and eight, 800 million people, and it's, it has mainly to do with human rights. And the last uh, convention, Istanbul Convention, issued in uh, 2011, is about um, the contrast uh, uh, against uh, domestic violence. And I think that is very, very important because it's not a, um, only a matter of, uh, I mean, uh, um, only in order to avoid crimes, but also is a matter of prevention and uh, starting from education, starting from, uh, I mean, uh, uh, family and so on. And I think that uh, this, uh, all of this uh, international legislation uh, is uh, thanks also to the women's movement and also uh, social mobilization. 
so which contributed to give a concrete approach to human rights. And as you know, um, gender-based violence was recognized as a violation of human rights only in 1993 during uh, the UN conference in Vienna. And then it was uh, taken as a matter of platform for action in 95 uh, in uh, Beijing. So, I mean, uh, it's uh, quite, I mean, uh, it's only 20 more, 20 years ago, and this year is uh, Beijing plus uh, 20, which is an, an important also way to see what we have done and what uh, should uh, we do, because Beijing was very important because uh, Western feminism was put into crisis, but uh, women coming from countries in development and in transition who wanted to have their own voice to talk about their situation. And the thing is that as women, we have to learn from different experiences. And just it's not a matter, I said also the other speakers, not a matter we want a women-centered world. We want just to live in peace, just where people can have prosperity, respect, and so on. So it's a common task, it's not, I mean, of all members of society. In the name also of future generation. Bueno, gure kasuan esan beharra dago legeak berak ba, jauzi kualitatibo bat suposatu zuela, gure e, erriko egoeran lehen aipatu dut zelan emakumen presentzia horrekatua izan, san, hortik aurrera, ba, gure lege biltzarrean, e, udalek berdintasun plana dute, baina e, legea bera e, da e, erramienta bat, tresna bat, eh? eta legea bera ez da helmuga, legea da tresna el muga horretara eltzeko eta el muga horretara eltzeko ba gizarte osoaren implikazioa beharra eta eta lana dugu, ez? E, administrazioak gure erantzukizuna dugu noski, baina e, len eta hasieran aipatu dadan mesala, ba gizarte osoaren implikazioa lana behar dugu, ba tresna hau, osea legeak betetzeko bere osotasunean eta berdintasun erreala lortzeko, ezta? Bueno, goaz beste galdera batera e, basetan, e, kasu honetan e, krisiari buruz da. E, eta horrela esaten du. E, como ha afectado la krisis ekonomika a las políticas públicas para fomentar la igualdad de género? Nor animatzen da, erantzuten. you want to uh, how the uh, it's a huge uh, question because of course uh, that uh, uh, women uh, also were uh, victims of this uh, crisis because uh, when uh, there is uh, unemployment, women also are, uh, uh, have more problems than uh, the men. And uh, uh, it's clear that uh, um, uh, we have uh, to, uh, to find new ways uh, just uh, to overcome a crisis, which is not only a matter of women, but also of men. Uh, in Italy, there are some attempts uh, with a very controversial also measure by the um, Prime Minister uh, Renzi, that is a job act. And uh, it's interesting because it foresees mainly uh, jobs uh, for uh, young people. And also there is a provision quite new that is that a woman who uh, was uh, who had a problem of domestic violence can have three weeks uh, of permits in order to uh, have um, the possibility to overcome the trauma. Uh, but I said, uh, it's uh, difficult to answer, uh, and I think that uh, it should be also not only a matter of national uh, um, uh, decision, but uh, at the European level. But what we see is a struggle, again, between the richest countries in Europe and the poorest, and I hope that this uh, contract between, uh, uh, between Germany, France, uh, and the other part, Greece, uh, can be in a such a way <coughs> overcome because uh, the crisis in, a, um, in Europe is not only a matter of uh, individual, uh, individuals and national state, but uh, it's a common matter. I would like to hear the questions from the audience, so I will say my time. So it was, yeah. Because we are going uh, Perfecto. Eh, eh, lo único que daría únicamente por responder una pregunta 
eh, que hace referencia a eh, sí que recientemente han aparecido diferentes movimientos contrarios al feminismo que son especialmente preocupantes porque provienen de gente joven y parece que está habiendo pasos atrás a pesar de las campañas por la igualdad de todos estos años y preguntan eh, si creéis, si creemos que algo así puede ocurrir o está ocurriendo en la Unión Europea con el feminismo y cómo hacemos para trabajar en la lucha por la igualdad, permitiendo al mismo tiempo que haya un debate público sin censuras ni linchamientos mediáticos. En cualquier caso, yo sí, en relación a la, a la anterior pregunta, eh, aurreco galderan eh, inguruan, vaya osnar que tabate guinda y conuque etada, crisiak eragina desberdina duela emakumengan eta gizonengan, eta hori kontuan hartu behar dala. E, krisi baino, krisia baino lehenago emakumen egoera txarragoa zen, zer eta normalean bat txarrago ordainduta lanetan daude, edo irugarren sektorean eta krisi hasieran ba, e, konstrukzio edo arlo hoietan e, ba, eragin handia goa eukizuen bezala, ba, gizonen gan, batez ere e, indarra handia eukizuela pentsatu zan, baina ikusi da zelan, Krisiak izugarrizko emaku, eragina duela emakumengan ez bakarrik euren lanetan horrek eukiko dauen, e, etorkizunan eukiko dauen ondorioetan eur, jasoko dituzten pentsioen ondorioak ere eukiko e, duelako eta ez bakarrik hori. E, krisiak suposatzen badu zerbitzuen murrizketa bat ba horrek e, emakumen kontra doala, ez? E, Respondemos a la pregunta de Rancho Tendogu, a Urrenti Kerindaco, eh, Rancho Nariz, feminismo en Inguruan, eta feminismo en contra de Agua en Mugimendu y en Inguruan, eta Gero pasa a Tengara, va a suo que eh, el Gitendu su en Galderetara. Es que ricasco. Eh, I just want to say that I think that, um, yeah. I just want to start to say that I think that feminism uh, is well aware and well familiar with the threats against it, such as, for example, part, the patriarchy, who isn't new, <laughs> who is like our, the, the biggest threat and um, consists everywhere. But this new movement, I can refer to the, the fa fascist and the racist parties that we see which is growing in, uh, in all of Europe. Uh, and we see this as a, quite a threat against uh, gender equality in terms of the, the, what they're trying to do is to create or to go back to a really stereotype uh, role of the, the woman where the woman should stay at home and raise the children and not go to work and etc. Cetera, et cetera. And so it's a really stereotype role of for the women, so this poses a real threat for us. Uh, sorry. I think, uh, as I said before, that it's more important than ever that uh, human rights activists and feminists organize together, not only within countries, but also transnationally, because this is what the fascists do right now. They organize all over Europe, so we have to do the same. And I also think that we have the potential of being this uh, clear and firm voice against these movements in politics, because I see a lot of the mainstream parties, they reject these new movements, but they are not very, always very clear. They don't always have the arguments, the rhetorics, the, the knowledge of how to speak against these movements. So I think we have to break uh, this uh, silence from, from the mainstream parties and, and to push in, in the other direction because when these uh, uh, fascist movements are growing, we can see that the mainstream is pushed towards that direction a little bit too. And that's a very dangerous development. So I think it's, it's a, we need a force that can push the mainstream in politics back to, to, to the rights in the direction of equality and human rights. And in the election campaign, we actually made a clear uh, statement on this. Our slogan was 
uh, out with the racists and in with the feminists. That was our uh, motto for, for voting. <laughs> One word, uh, just uh, to say that, uh, of course, not only just to the crisis, but uh, just uh, due to, um, I mean, uh, forms uh, of racism, we have uh, in Europe an increase in use of hate speeches. That is anti-Islamophobia, uh, uh, misogenic uh, speeches, uh, uh, um, uh, Islamophobia. We have a different way to express fear uh, towards future and the otherness, uh, so that is against, uh, against Roma, against women, against... Uh, so um, it's uh, a very difficult time, uh, also not only for uh, um, right-wing uh, uh, parties, but mainly also for neo-populist parties, uh, which uh, are uh, also quite uh, dangerous because they are uh, using, uh, in a very instrumental way, the people, and so in terms of fear, about the future, the otherness, migrants, and so on. So we have to have a coalition against this uh, kind of uh, hate speeches. Bueno, eta orain eh, norbaite galderaren bat eh, badeko, aukera deko zue. Bai. Parkatu mikrofonoa, e, e, es, gure badu zuen esan, edo orkestu eta gero egin galdera, baina beti mikrofonoa erabiliz e, itzulpena egin alizateko. Vale, pues yo me llamo Juan Aranguren y formo parte de la candidatura a la que han hecho referencia llamada PLAS y bueno, quería felicitarles a las tres por su intervención y bueno, preguntarles a, a las miembros de Iniciativa Feminista Sueca que a ver si tenéis, eh, como plante, acaba de plantear Cristín, que que es necesario hacer una alianza entre los grupos y partidos, iniciativas, plataformas feministas europeas, si ellas, que ya, eh, bueno, que son un ejemplo para nosotras, ¿no? en la medida que han, han, han demostrado que las candidaturas feministas pueden conseguir representantes políticas, ¿no? que a ver si ellas tienen alguna estrategia para ir creando estas redes entre, entre, los, entre plataformas feministas europeas, pues de cara a las europeas, de cara a, bueno, yo qué sé, a crear es empezar a crear esas redes para poder apoyarnos entre nosotras, ¿no? Uh, that's a very good and important question, and we just started to work on this uh, now. Uh, I mean, we have been uh, networking with the f existing feminist parties in Europe for uh, a few years already, but only with the formally registered. So we had one in uh, Poland, in Germany, and uh, Spain. Um, but we also recognize that we actually have more in common with a lot of movements who are not registered as parties. Um, uh, growing movements that, uh, that come from the grassroots but have not formed parties, and I think we have to work more broadly, not only with political parties, but with initiatives that can affect uh, politics. And, and more concretely, uh, we are planning to do a handbook uh, on like how to do a campaign, how we did it, tell about the history of the feminist initiative. We need a handbook in English. We need a lot of materials to put up uh, on our web, web page uh, in English and in other languages so the more people can understand. And what we're doing now is that we are uh, touring in Europe and trying to meet everyone and just learn what are the obstacles, what are the possibilities uh, here in Italy, in other countries, uh, and try to develop some sort of a common strategy, but also we need different strategies in different countries because you have different debates, uh, different problems. So we would very much like to continue this dialogue that we started with you yesterday in the um, uh, Casa de las Mujeres uh, and trying to develop how can we support you here uh, in your campaign and how can you support us, how can we build this network. So. I think we must have an ongoing dialogue about this and maybe we should write this handbook together because after the, the election campaign you will have a lot of knowledge and a lot of experience that would be useful for us and for, for more uh, movements in Europe. Sí. Hola, buenas, soy Jesús Marí. Eh, habéis estado planteando aquí varios temas de, de la vida familiar, ¿no? 
Entonces, eh, claro, decía 12 semanas él y ella, pero eso es una equivocación, eso es puro reformismo. Tiene que ser obligatorio, 12 semanas él y 12 ellas, porque si no, y los resultados están aquí, él no coge nunca, la que coge es la mujer y su carrera profesional se ve mermada totalmente por el hecho de la maternidad. Yo hace 35 o 40 años leía un libro de Margaret Mead que ponía que una tribu de Oceanía, los hombres se metían a la cama cuando paría la mujer. ¿Eh? Entonces, el, 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 el hecho de, de, del embarazo, del parto y de la lactancia no es un hecho de la mujer, es un hecho del hombre. Y una de las cosas mal es que se mide tantos niños por cada mujer. Aquí tenemos uno con uno, en Francia dos con uno. ¿Pero por qué? Por la mujer. O sea, entonces pienso que eso eh, sería una directiva europea donde planteara esto. Luego, los 10 años que llevan aquí en Emacume no han servido para nada. Hoy en día la juventud es más machista que lo que éramos nosotros hace 40 años. Es más machista. Entonces, ¿de qué ha servido esa educación en los colegios? Hay, y ahí hay un problema. En los colegios se les está dando la taba a los chavales de la igualdad, de tal y cual... Y después va a su casa y ve que su padre está tumbado en el sofá con una cerveza viendo la televisión y la madre hace la cena, plancha la ropa, prepara la ropa para el día siguiente del colegio. Y a la mañana cuando se levanta es su madre la que les da a desayunar. La que les... Y muchas mujeres ya van cansadas a trabajar porque han tenido dos horas a la mañana para todo eso. Y nosotros los hombres nos vamos al trabajo. Entonces pienso que esto también había que hacer una directiva de un código civil donde estuviera como obligación de los hombres, el compartir las tareas con el hogar y que esto fuera considerado como una falta, como la violencia de género. Es decir, ese hombre no contribuye, pues ese hombre tiene que contribuir. La mujer puede hacer un, un asunto, había una película que por no hacer la, fu la fuente era un país árabe, dijeron aquí no se folla mientras no se haga la fuente. Podía ser eso un planteamiento, eso sería a nivel interfamiliar pero tenía que haber un código civil que recogiera como obligación, porque si no nosotros somos especialistas en escaquearnos. Entonces, mientras no haya una ley, aparte de la, de la revolución cultural, no, esto no se recoja en leyes, tanto la maternidad, los permisos de maternidad, para que, y entonces con este sentido los empleadores, los patronos no tendrían problema. Si el hombre va a coger 12 semanas y la mujer también, obligatoriamente, le daría igual contratar hombres y mujeres. Pero mientras sigamos así, ¿no? los hombres nos escaqueamos del cuidado de los niños, del cuidado de los mayores, todo eso en el Código Civil. Pienso yo, y vosotras que estáis en el Parlamento Europeo, pues ahí hay que dar caña. Uh, actually, in Sweden, we have 450 days paid leave, I think, but the 12 weeks or two months is uh, the mandatory for the father. And now the, the, the politicians in power, they want to extend this to three months, but for us, it's not enough. We want a 50-50% share, and that's one of our main issues in, in the national politics, that... Uh, of course, you can choose, but what the government supports, uh, what the government pays for, should be um, equal share. I mean, everyone should share a parentship for the children equally. And this will, of course, have a huge effect on the labor market, on employers. They can no longer expect that women will uh, be home uh, with children longer than men. They would have to expect this for men, too. Uh, so... I mean, I totally agree that we, we need uh, legislation that supports equal uh, parenthood. And if, uh, for the, the legislation on the EU level, maybe you know that there is a, a maternity leave directive that is uh, stuck because some member states, they say no. Uh, the parliament has suggested, suggested uh, uh, 18 weeks, I think, or even 20 weeks. Uh, right now we have 14 weeks as the, the lowest uh, in the EU, I think. Um, but, um, you know, the member states have to agree on it. So, um, if the Commission uh, withdraws this suggestion, maybe there's an opportunity to put forward something new that is even better, that is a parent leave directive and not just mother's leave directive. Even if it's an important step, of course, that we support, but we should also make it... Uh, gender neutral, so that uh, it's a parent leave uh, legislation. Um, we have uh, the directive on uh, uh, the right of paternal leave since uh, 1996. 
The fact is it was not compulsory and, uh, only and uh, um, there was also the need to have uh, also good example of men who uh, decided just not uh, just to stay uh, home uh, with children. Uh, for instance, uh, um, we have started as a university, just uh, uh, people working uh, personnel, administrative, but professor. And I think that it's very important to give good examples when uh, there is no law where it is compulsory. But now, mentalities are changing. But what I'm saying from the matrifocal point of view, because in Italy, there is the culture of mother at the center of the family in terms of matrifocalism. So for culture, it would be impossible to think in Italy that men and women should care the child the same way, because for us, the fact that there is a culturally a relationship with a child, uh, breathing, uh, and, uh, and so on. So it's uh, also a matter also uh, of the idea of mother. But what is very important is not uh, just to uh, say that uh, it's um, uh, obligatory for men to work at home like the women da uh, do, but it's a matter also of the education of mother. Because uh, mother, they have also to educate uh, children to equality, because uh, if you have to impose something where they are adult, it's really too late. And in many cases, mm. Italian women, they, when they cook, they work, uh, I think, uh, there is a blog called 27 Hours of the uh, newspaper Corriere della Sera. But why 27 hours? Because women work uh, daily three hours more than men, and, uh, uh, and uh, because in Italy, for instance, to cook is a, a value, but uh, to cook is at least, uh, uh, because it's a matter of family, it's at least three hours more for women every day to buy, to cook, to clean. And in many cases, women, Italian women do not want to share because they cook best, they clean best, they do best than men. So I think that is a matter of education starting for women, from mother, and from the ideas that women have about their motherhood. And uh, for Italian culture, it, I think the Spanish too, it's a quite uh, big issue because it's something perceived as an invasion of men into some uh, parts related to care, care of children, care of elderly, and so on. So it's really a huge uh, battle because in many cases women do want uh, to uh, continue just to care and uh, children and elderly. So it's, there, is, there are a lot of also cultural difference we have to deal in Europe. Can I just answer to that? Okay. Yes. Uh, I, I realize that there is a lot of cultural differences and problems, uh, but I also think that uh, economic instruments can be very effective in also changing the attitudes. For example, in Sweden, we have had uh, for a couple of years this, this bonus that you get extra money if you share more equally. The more equal you share, the more money you will get. And this has all actually shown a change in attitude and a change uh, with, uh, that men actually take more, uh, more uh, leave, parental leave. Uh, for a while, uh, I think it was, um, uh, for a while we also had that if you have two children very close to each other, you also get more benefits. And of course, this resulted in people having, you know, planning to have children more close to each other. Uh, so I think the... Sorry? We don't have children. It's 1.9%. Okay, yeah. But uh, I think, it, it, I mean, economic instruments can be very effective. You can start there and then the attitudes will follow. Bueno, por, por alusión, es decir que, bueno, pues que evidentemente desde hace 10 años que se aprobó la ley, pues no se ha conseguido que la igualdad sea real y efectiva. Creo sinceramente que que seríamos magas si hubiéramos conseguido que esa, real, que esa igualdad fuera real y efectiva en estos diez años. Lo que sí le puedo garantizar es que ha habido un esfuerzo por parte no solo de las diferentes direcciones del Instituto, sino desde diferentes departamentos del Gobierno y no solo desde el ámbito institucional, sino desde diferentes movimientos de mujeres, el movimiento feminista, asociaciones… Bueno, pues trabajando día a día eh, y, como bien decía, eh, trasladando el ejemplo que es fundamental ¿no? eh, para que las nuevas generaciones bueno, pues comprendan que las relaciones entre chicos y chicas deben de estar basadas en el respeto, en la autonomía, en la libertad. Eh, 
en la ley del año 2005 eh, supuso un antes y un después, eh, pues empezando porque hasta ese año el único organismo, por ejemplo, en gobierno que se ocupaba de temas de igualdad era Macunde, pasando a que ahora en todos los departamentos del gobierno hay unidades de igualdad en las diputaciones, en los ayuntamientos eh, con, y, y infinidad de ejemplos. ¿no? Por ejemplo, el hecho de que las mujeres puedan eh, compatibilizar su pensión de viudedad con la renta de garantía de ingreso fue gracias a la aprobación de la ley de igualdad. Eh, ¿Con esto ¿qué, quiere, qué quiero decir? ¿Que está todo conseguido? No, evidentemente no. Y no es ese el objetivo, pero yo creo que también debemos de poner en valor los pasos que hemos dado, los logros que hemos dado, porque han sido gracias al esfuerzo de muchísimas personas desde diferentes ámbitos. Y no reconocerlo sería no agradecer el esfuerzo de todas esas personas, entidades, instituciones que se han implicado y se han comprometido con la igualdad. Dicho esto, eh, evidentemente… Eh, el tema de la corresponsabilidad, de un reparto responsable en las tareas de cuidado y en la, en, tanto de los menores como de las personas de, de los y las menores como de las personas dependientes, considero que es un tema crucial y que ese reparto no sea equitativo, evidentemente, como usted ha dicho, hace que las mujeres no puedan tener un desarrollo de sus carreras profesionales en igualdad de condiciones que los hombres. Es un, un tema eh, necesario, es un tema en el que tenemos que dar muchos pasos y no en vano es uno de los ejes estratégicos del plan de igualdad, ¿no? la necesidad de avanzar en esa necesaria corresponsabilidad que posibilite que hombres y mujeres puedan participar en el mercado laboral en mejores condiciones, en igualdad de condiciones o que por lo menos puedan promocionar en sus carreras de una manera parecida. ¿no? Y luego, evidentemente… Bueno, pues yo eh, lo que quiero decirle es que hay mucho. No, no, esta es una pregunta fácil. Que sí, tiene. sí. Eh, yo lo que quiero decirle es que eh, probablemente estemos haciendo esa pregunta eh, desde nuestro punto de vista y nuestra experiencia personal con el recorrido personal que cada uno y cada una de nosotras podemos tener. Quiero decir que yo no sé hasta qué punto nosotros y nosotras con 14, 15 años éramos conscientes de si éramos más o menos igualitarios. Pero, dicho esto, eh, también quiero decir que, en, que si esos chicos y chicas no son tan igualitarios como nosotros y nosotras quisiéramos, eh, probablemente en ello tengamos mucha culpa todos y todas nosotras, porque es el mensaje que les estamos trasladando. ¿no? Esos chicos y esas chicas están en construcción y esos chicos y esas chicas no nacen sabidos. Reciben los mensajes de su entorno más próximo, de su familia, de los medios de comunicación, que muchas veces los mensajes que lanzan no son precisamente los más eh, acordes eh, con la igualdad. Eh, por eso, terminaba mi intervención al inicio diciendo que, evidentemente, la ley es una herramienta, es una buena herramienta, porque si estamos así con ley, ¿cómo estaríamos si no tuviéramos ley o otro tipo de herramientas? pero que, evidentemente, necesitamos seguir dando pasos, necesitamos reconocer que sí que hemos avanzado, que ha sido gracias al esfuerzo de muchas personas, pero que todavía nos queda mucho camino por recorrer y, en la medida en la que seamos capaces de reconocer que nos queda mucho camino por recorrer, pues intentar buscar alianzas desde diferentes ámbitos para ir dando pasos y siendo conscientes de que esto requiere un cambio de mentalidades que no se puede dar, ¿qué más quisiéramos?, de un día para otro, sino que requiere, precisamente para que se pueda dar, de la implicación de, de todos y todas y desde diferentes ámbitos. ¿no? Yo quería preguntar si conocen el movimiento de Internet que se llama I don't need feminism y, y qué valoración o qué lectura hacen del mismo. Se llama I don't need feminism. Um, 
it's a movement where people tweet or Instagram their, their pictures. Where with a, well, I invite you to see it because it's very interesting, very um, con very dist distressing as well. Where um, mainly women or young young girls um, show up a paper where they say, "I don't need feminism because of this and this and that." So um, there's some, somehow a backlash in, in in new generations of women saying that they don't really need feminism because they, they are happy how they are or because they, are, they don't, they don't want to be victimized or they don't feel less than, than men or a series of reasons. Um, I don't know. <laughs> um, I think you need to see it if, if, if you don't know it. <laughs> well, then we should put them in contact with our youth uh, organization. <laughs> I heard about uh, uh, this thing I saw, so the pictures, uh, and it's clear that also is a provocation, uh, because in many cases also younger generation who are living in Western country and they have plenty, I mean, a, a lot of uh, rights, they think that uh, they are given for granted and are not the product of centuries of uh, struggles since the, the death of Olympe de Guche in 1791 because she was killed not only because she was against Robespierre during the French Revolution, but because she also drafted the la Declaration pour la droit de la, de la, de la, de la donne la citoyenne, the right of women and citizens. So I think that it was really a provocation to say we don't need, but it means that they had a lot of rights uh, that uh, which were obtained uh, t um, thanks uh, to the struggles of women before them. So I think that perhaps they have also to know a little bit uh, more about history. And so perhaps uh, the uh, colleagues, the Swedish colleague could also get in contact with them and just uh, to start a dialogue. So it would be very effective. And I also think that we have to still acknowledge that there is still a lot of reward for women who, I mean, for all women and men who confirm with the current gender roles. I mean, it's, uh, it's still quite difficult to be a feminist uh, in the society. You, you get uh, excluded, you, people question you. Of course, it's more comfortable uh, to stay in these gender roles. And for many young people, maybe they don't have alternatives, uh, they don't see uh, other movements that they could join. So that's something also that we have to take responsibility and work to reach out to, to try to reach out to everyone and even to the groups that we today maybe have difficulties uh, reaching. Uh, that there are a lot of caricatures against women since the uh, late uh, 18th, 19th century when Pankhurst uh, and uh, her daughter started the suffragette uh, movement. And so um, um, families were pictured as aggressive, uh, as spinsters, uh, as uh, very male, uh, with uh, male faces and so on and so on. And it is uh, continue also in communist countries because a lot, I worked a lot uh, in uh, also socialist countries in Russia. And for instance, uh, also worked in crisis centers in uh, the, um, uh, in the uh, Arctic area, in Arkhangelsk, Arctic area of Russia. And these uh, women, we were working with them against crisis in crisis centers, say that it was not, it was very difficult for them to be recognized as feminists because for uh, communists were a bourgeois categories and uh, for them uh, feminists was a synonym of lesbian, so hate of men. So it was uh, also, this uh, shows also the fear of men regarding also women who are asking for the respect of human rights. So in many cases, the history of women is connoted also by misogenic portraits of feminists. And I think that we have also very different meaning of feminism in Europe, because in, Swedish, in Sweden is very democratic in terms of parity, equal rights. In other countries, they are more, so to say, separatist, also in the Italian and French tradition. So we have different meanings of, uh, um, of uh, feminism. So, but I think that the easiest way is not just to be, to use ideologies, but uh, 
to have a dialogue face to face uh, and to understand what the other people mean. And just that uh, what uh, also feminists uh, are looking for is uh, prosperity, uh, fairness, uh, uh, and really a democratic, substantially democratic society. Eh, esan bai, eh, izen horrekin edo beste izen batzuekin ba, bai daudela mugimenduak eh, feminismoaren kontra eta berdintasunaren kontra. Guri ere gertatzen jaku, ba, hainbat kampaina edo eh, ekimen eh, martxan jartzen dugu zenean, ba, jasotzen ditugula, eh, ba, sare sozialen bitartez edo korreoen bitartez, ba, kontrako, kontrako eh, erantzunak, ez? E, beraz, horrek adierazten du, ba, lana dugula egiteko. Eta uste dut, e, bueno, ja beratzirek eta hogeta boz direzela, e, igual amaitutzat e, maten dugu, e, bueno, e, eskertu e, gure e, iru islari eri, marinari, kristini eta alessandrari bere partaidetza, e, Globernantz Institutuari berriro eskertu hemen egoteko gonbida penal usatzeagatik eta bueno argi geratu da ba e, berdintasuna benetako berdintasuna lortzeko oraindik asko dagoela egiteko baina e, bueno ba e, alderdi feministek e, isugarrizko lana egiten ari e, direla eta bueno ba gizarte osoaren e, implikazioa behar dugula ba benetako e, berdintasuna e, lortzeko eta amaitu gure neunke ba e, kasu honetan e, Alexandrak esan duen e, esaldiarekin, ez? E, berdintasuna gure gizartearen gaisotasunen e, bueno, ba ba konponbidea dala. Eskerrik asko guztioi.